How to make a medieval gown. Step one, buy a book about garments from about 500 years ago. Step one and a half, I guess. Realize that it only has half the information that you need, so go and buy a second book. Step two, make a video about scaling up the pattern, another video about making a mock-up, and a third video about just the cord for good measure. Step three, sew about 95% of the dress, then shove it into the back of the closet because you're intimidated by the last step. Step four, reluctantly dig it back out of the closet about a year or so later, take a deep breath, and go ahead and tackle that woven hem. And then step five, prance about in the forest in your new medieval gown. Okay, I guess you probably want me to cover that whole sewing bit back there. All right, BT Dubs, there will likely be a sponsorship Morgan lurking about somewhere later in this video, so keep an eye on that one, she's shifty. All right, to the sewing. Actually, a very quick summary of the project so far. There's this really cool Norse settlement called Heriosnes in Greenland around the 11th to 15th century, and a bunch of their clothes were found, which is fantastic for our modern understanding of medieval clothing construction and I'm going to recreate this one. The mock-up that I made fit fairly well around the bust and shoulders, but there were a few small changes that I wanted to go ahead and make. The sleeves were a smidge shorter than I liked, so I added about an inch of length to the sleeve pattern by splitting it just below the elbow and adding an inch of paper between and then sort of smoothing out the rough edges. The hem is also about an inch higher than I liked. Don't mind that it's really uneven. That'll get trimmed up in the end. So I added an inch to the bottom of all my pattern skirt pieces. No need to add it into the middle like I did with the sleeves. Just tacking it on to the end is fine. Then I set out my pattern pieces onto the wool twill fabric, and I tried to lay everything out in a fairly economical fashion, I, so I wasted as little of the fabric as possible. Make sure to check if your pattern has a seam allowance included or not. Mine does not, so I made sure to leave an inch of space between each piece, and then added a scant half inch around every outline for seam allowance. A clear ruler is so handy for adding seam allowances like this. A little trick for keeping the straight grain on each pattern piece lined up correctly with the fabric underneath is to line up one end of your ruler with the selvage, note the measurement distance to the straight grain line, and then travel the ruler down the selvage checking that the straight grain mark is at the same measurement. I admit I usually just kind of eyeball it, but checking like this can be handy sometimes too. To mark the top center of the front split, I made a little hole and marked the fabric through the paper in my chalk, and then I used a straight edge to connect this mark with the center front bottom edge. Once I was satisfied that I had marked out all of my pieces, I cut out everything with a rotary wheel. Yeah, maybe not necessarily the most medieval tool out there, but dang if it isn't precise and fast. As I finished cutting up all of my pieces out, I had a moment of curiosity and wondered how closely my fabric matched up to the original. So I took a little tiny bit of the spare fabric left over and I cut a wee little one centimeter by one centimeter square as precisely as I could. From there, I tried to count out how many threads there were in each direction, both in the weft and the warp. I counted twice just to be extra sure, and I ended up with a thread count of around 13 for the weft and 11 for the warp. If I compare that to the original, there's this handy chart in Medieval Garments Reconstructed, and I'm making the second one down. You can see that the original fabric was a two-toned gray with dark on the warp and light on the weft. I went with a single natural sheep's wool color white, mostly because it's the closest fabric I could find at the time, and white on white twill was also documentable, as you can see from the child's garment down below. Back to the thread count, looks like the original had about 10 versus 16 to 14 threads per centimeter, and while my 11 to 13 isn't exactly the same, I'm gonna go ahead and call it pretty darn close enough. The Tutu Twill Fabric was originally purchased from Tudor Taylor, by the way. I will make sure to add a link to their shop down below in the description. 
I laid out all of my finished pieces so that I could make sure that nothing was missing and that I could get them all arranged in the right order and then pinned together. The extant gown had a really interesting seam arrangement with sort of an over under pattern to how the seam allowances were treated. The allowances on the inside flit directions, which has a really fun dimensional effect. The new seam is getting pinned towards the left and I'm using the chalk marks to line up the seam correctly and then pins to sort of hold it all in place. Some of the seams on the original garment are described as showing evidence of being sewn from the right side, which is what I'm trying to do here. I was a little shaky at first, but quickly got plenty of practice from sewing the mini, mini, mini seams on this dress. Another little nifty seam treatment thing from the originals is the false seams. The dress is mostly made up of narrow panels with the exception of a pair at the side back. They are actually big panels with darts at the top for shaping and then a false seam down the length of it so that it looks like the same as all the other panels. This was done by making a very tiny little pin tuck type pleat. The devotion to symmetry and a balanced overall look is just fascinating. One of the questions that I get pretty often for any project is how long did it take you to make this? Unfortunately, I don't really tend to track my minutes on projects. They just simply take as long as they take, you know, uh, several hours of stitching every other day and eventually someday, maybe two years later, it's finally done. After stitching a seam, I always leave behind this like little trail of uncut thread breadcrumbs. I don't think it actually really matters if you cut as you go or wait until the end, but either way, get those seams cleaned up. Stitching the gores. The side seams are mostly done, so let's go ahead and go back to the center front and center back triangular inserts. I might have accidentally cut the same piece twice, but we can just flip it over and it'll be fine. The straight edges will be stitched together. I pinned them first and then whip stitched from the outside. I don't believe I really talked about my thread yet. I'm actually using a 100% undyed wool thread to match the color of the fabric. And this is a single ply. In truth, I should have gotten a two ply, but I couldn't find a thread with the right fiber content to do what I want. So this will have to do. By the way, I want to show you my favorite method of making a knot in the thread. If you take a needle in one hand, the thread in the other, and then cross them over like so, you can hold the thread against the needle and then loop it around three or four times, pinch the loops, and then pull the needle through. I was taught this as a kid and was told that it was called a kissing knot because you kiss the needle and thread ends together. So cute. And it makes a really tidy knot. Whip stitch until you have a seam, and then we are going to iron this nice and flat. That triangle is going to need somewhere to go, so next I'll cut open the center front to the marked length. I recommend using longer scissors because, like, this is taking way too long. Come on now. Hurry it up. Here's our new center front, and this is where the triangle is going to be set. But first, I do need to fold back all of the seam allowances. It starts out very narrow at the point of the V, and then gradually widens out to like the normal seam allowance once I get further down the seam. Now I'll add the triangle insert, getting it placed just so, and then pinning it in place. Continue down the length of the front seams. Starting at the top center is highly recommended because it'll prevent the triangle from kind of going askew and not fitting right. Then I stitched the insert, keeping with the trend so far of stitching from the outside of the garment. Also tricky at first, but uh, this really started to grow on me as a technique as the project went on. It was around here that I had gone through my entire spool of wool thread. Fortunately, I bought two, so disaster pre-averted. To help set the alternating seam allowance pattern, I lightly top stitched all of the seams so far so that the allowances would stay in the correct direction. This was further helped along when I overcast the raw edges inside later, but this will keep things kind of tidy until then. All of the front and side gores are stitched together, just need to go ahead and add that back panel. I'll prepare the folded edges first and uh, I'm starting to realize I might have a bit of a pin overuse problem. This seems like way too many pins. I mean, I'm all for sewing precision, but wow, that is a lot of pins. 
Anyways, the edges are ready for the back panel to be added now. I just need to line up this little chalk mark with the top of the last side gore, and then I'll start pinning from the top down. Since I marked the seam allowances, it's really easy to match the folded edge with the gray chalk mark and get just the right seam allowance the whole way down. Then I'll grab myself some new thread and start stitching those last two body seams. With the body assembled, let's take a look at the sleeves. There's actually a pretty nifty diagram showing how the original sleeve gussets were stitched in. I was really excited to try it out. So I matched up my seam allowances just like I've been doing for the rest of the project and pinned the gusset into the sleeves. I stitched that and then the other side of the gusset and down the whole length of the sleeves, leaving the last few inches open as per the original and no, your eyes are not deceiving you. The cuff edges are absolutely uneven, which was also following the extant example. It's kind of weird, but it adds like an interesting flavor. Now I'm adding the first row of top stitches and you might notice that I'm not doing a running stitch like so in the usual fast back and forth traveling along the needle, very angled, taking several stitches at once. But no, instead I am completing each stitch separately, stabbing the needle perpendicularly to the fabric. This results in much more of the thread being visible on the surface and makes it a slightly more decorative effect. The original had quite close and compact stitches of the style. I was maybe a little bit lazy with mine. The sleeves and the neckline both had two rows of this stitching and I'm doing the same. Next are the shoulder seams. I pin them down and then pin them together and then play the song of the whip stitch. Curiously, the shoulder seams is one of the few seams on the extant Harry Yelsness garments that very often had these seams pressed and stitched open rather than to one side. To attach the sleeves, I must first find the shoulder mark and then line that up with the shoulder seam. I'm going to pin down the rest of the sleeve and then attach the second one. I'm really happy with how this is coming together so far and I'm really pleased that attaching the sleeves in this way is surprisingly easy. I thought it would take a lot more finagling. I also bought some handmade needles for this project and experimented with them throughout. They definitely handle differently. Uh, I found that they tended to want to go around the woven threads rather than through them, which makes sense, they're more blunt. And it worked fairly well for a nice fluffy wool like this, but I do suspect they'd be a bit more difficult on really fine or tightly woven fabrics. I bought the handmade needles from a variety of different sellers and very quickly lost track of which ones came from whom, but I will do my best to link them all down below. I gave all of the seams a good thorough ironing. Using an ironing ham is great for really odd curved spots like the sleeve head. Finishing the seams. Now that the sleeves are attached, I want to get this neckline finished. I'll fold back the seam allowance first and use that handy chalk as a guide until it looks something like this. Now I'm measuring out a doubled length of wool yarn, measuring around the neck, plus a few extra inches just in case. I use the yarn to cover the raw edge of the fabric inside the neck seam allowance. Just grab a thread or two from the bottom, pop up about halfway through the seam allowance, and then wrap around the yarn. Woven Into the Earth theorizes that this was to help prevent stretching and warping of the neckline and to create a bit of what they describe as a decorative fullness which is very neat. When the filler threads are all done, I then added two rows of top stitching, just like the sleeve cuffs. Notice how this part of the neckline is looking puffy and, and rounded looking, while the top stitch section looks very nice and flat and crisp. First row down, adding a second row of stitches. I know it's not super visible since this is all the same color, but it really does make a texture difference in person. Moving down the hem, there are quite a few longer parts like this one that need to get trimmed to match the, the rest of the hem. And I tried it on to double check the overall length and wow, yes, this is just as unflattering as I expected it to be, but the hem doesn't look like it needs to be trimmed up too much higher. So at least that's good to go. I ended up leaving it longer than my chalk marks. So let's give it a little bit of a, a bath to clean those up. And here's where I put it away for 12 months. Literally 
all the stuff you just saw was filmed in like 2019. So now in the last bit of 2020 and the early part of 2021, I finally got the courage to pull it back out of the closet and tackle that tablet woven hem just like the original had. I made a whole video just for that. Definitely check it out if you haven't seen it already. And I, I think I'm gonna try and put a playlist of all the videos in this project in one spot. Uh, I know that there are definitely several of them at this point. I also added filler threads to the raw edges inside the dress, starting at the hem and working my way up. Theoretically, this will help prevent the side seams from stretching out along the bias over time and protect the raw cut fabric edges from wear and tear. But honestly, all practicalities aside, it just looks cool. We are so darn close to done. Just one of the last steps is to add pocket holes to the second panel from the front. I measured down from the arm side and then double checked the original distance in my reference book so I could get that right. Figured out where to pin and cut. I then pinched back the seam allowances, top stitched them in place, and then covered the raw edges with more filler thread. The basic opening is done, but let's go ahead and add some pizzazz. Remember those wool finger loop braids that I made forever ago? It's their time to shine. So here's my fabric and the braid that I'm attaching. I just sort of grab a little nip of the fabric edge and then one face of the braid. You can sort of see here that the braid is actually a square profile with four sides. I'm trying to make sure that I'm always grabbing the same side with every stitch so that it looks really consistent like this on the outside of the gown. Two hand openings done and now to the neck. I'm going to add the braid in the exact same way. I absolutely found stitching this from the inside to be the most effective for this process. On the extant gowns, the researchers made no mention that I could see for how the braid was stitched, so I just kind of made it up into something that I felt might be plausible. Lastly, we have the sleeve edges. I've already done one here, so now to tackle the second one. This is such a cool decoration detail. I'm really glad that I picked a gown that had evidence of the braid in all three places, the, the neck, the sleeve, and the pocket opening. It's so neat. It's time. It's time to iron the dress so that it can look its absolute best, and we can kind of get all of these new stitches sort of melded into the fabric. It's also time to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is such a cool website. Some of my absolute favorite videos here on YouTube are just of folks showing stuff that they know and that's like Skillshare's whole jam. It's a whole website just for learning videos. Like Mr. Donner recently gifted me a fancy new lens and that has just gotten me all sorts of extra keen on photography lately. Uh, I've been enjoying Jessica Calbasi's new series on portrait photography. I love that it's not super gear specific, gear dependent. It's more about using light and angles, props, you know, all these things to the best possible results with just whatever you have. Uh, if you aren't into photography, fair, there's drawing like appropriate for beginners looked cool or how to write a song in case you want to try your hand at making the next sea shanty. Mm -hmm. The first 1,000 subscribers to click on the link in the description will get a free trial of the premium membership so that you can explore your creativity, whether it's photography, drawing, music, whatever strikes your fancy. Alrighty, let's try on this dress. I really, really enjoyed this dress, even the parts that scared me maybe especially all the hard parts that scared me. The end result might be a little bit of a ugly potato sack, but you know, I am damn proud of how much I put into making it as similar to the original gown from Heriosness as I possibly could. There, there are absolutely small allowances that I made for what I could find, but for the most part, I truly tried to get as close as I could. It was a really fun exercise. I'm, I'm all for using a machine for the majority of my projects, for sure. But there is something satisfying about trying to do something 100% by hand and, and trying out all the original techniques. This was a lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoyed my year, year and a half long making adventure. Uh, and thank you so much for watching.